So the Carvera Air is a very interesting CNC. It is less than half the price of its older brother, the first Carvera. Let's get into all the things that you can make with this machine and see how it stacks up against the competition. So the Carvera Air is currently on Kickstarter, and uh, that might be a no-go for you, depending on how you guys like to do Kickstarter. One good thing about this is this is the second machine from Makeera, and the first one they also released on Kickstarter, and it came out. Um, so you probably can feel pretty confident that this one is going to come out eventually. But depending on the backer level you get it at, uh, this machine is around fourteen to fifteen hundred bucks, and that's compared to fifty-five hundred dollars for its bigger brother. I think they're saying this is going to retail around twenty. 2200 bucks, but I actually think it is a pretty good value with what all you get with this machine. So let's kind of walk through it overall. So sorry about the reflection on the enclosure. And honestly, the enclosure is probably what I like least about this machine. It's like pretty flimsy acrylic. Um, they're definitely saving some money on this versus what they used on the other machine. But the features where it actually matters for the performance, they really didn't cut many corners. This is a solid die cast frame. And if I was to turn this on, you're going to hear the fans pop up. It's going to get a little bit louder in here. They've got this LED light in the front, and this is a status indicator. So that's really handy so you can see what's going on with the machine. Now, I don't have it on here, but they also give you a little bracket that you can put a tablet to, to be able to control the machine. And you're going to be using their controller software. What's nice about that is you can connect over USB as well as Wi-Fi. So I have seen people use like phone or even little tablets just to be able to jog the machine around as well as run files directly from the machine. And one accessory that it comes with that I really like is an emergency stop, but this isn't built directly into the machine. You can see you can kind of move this around. So depending on where you have this set up, you can have this right next to you. And if you're coming from a laser or a 3D printer side of things, an emergency stop is great, but if you are using a CNC, uh, an emergency stop is required because at some point you definitely will cut into things that you didn't mean to. So you're able to stop it, which sends a command to the machine that locks it so you can see that it is red. And then once you release that emergency stop, it eventually will come back on. Now the money end of the machine is this spindle right here. This is a 200 watt spindle. Um, and you've got a collet in here that can take bits all the way up to a quarter of an inch. And I actually thought it was gonna be limited to these eighth inch bits just in terms of performance, but it was really nice to see that I could run quarter inch bits and specifically I was able to do soft metals. So I was doing some aluminum cutting. That's what's on here right now and overall performed pretty well. Now, when you come to a machine like this, your work area is going to be a lot smaller than if you're comparing this to like a more traditional woodworking CNC where those can be like four feet by four feet to four feet by eight feet. Uh, this is not that whatsoever. The rough work area on this is 12 by eight by five inches. So much smaller. And they've got their probe that is always attached. Probe has several different features that we're going to get into here in a minute. I'm going to connect to the machine real quick. You can do that two different ways. There's a USB port on the back, so you can just hardwire in. And they also have a Wi-Fi connection, so uh, you can be remote to the machine. And anytime I say Wi-Fi, I want to be real clear that you don't need to be connected to the internet. <clears throat> Glowforge. You can just connect to it over a local network. In fact, the Carvera controller, which you'll use to control the machine, runs locally on pretty much anything that you'd want it to. So in my case, I'm using a Mac, but you can also use a PC. They have an Android app, I think currently, and an iOS one along the way. So especially if you're using a little tablet along with the holder they've got, um, that's really easy to pull up the controller software. I'm gonna jog this to the front to show another feature they've got with this that I really like. You've got this tool setter in the back, which is always gonna be able to help you find your zero point for your tool. And that's something you're going to have to do a good bit. A lot of machines, you might even have to do that manually, um, or they're going to have some type of touch probe that you attach to it. Uh, but being able to hit just a couple buttons, like if I do that right now, all it has to do is drop down, and then it's going to find the zero point, and then you're going to be good to go. And that is really, really handy to use. Now, before we get into some actual projects, there are a few things that I don't like about the design overall. We already talked about the enclosure. It still works, but it's like not super special. The way they currently have the desk collection, a lot of the parts are actually 3D printed and you're gonna have to bring your own vac system to this. There's a port on the back that you can plug a vacuum into, but the brackets for this tube, as well as this guy, which goes right down here and locks in with a couple screws is also 3D printed. I'm guessing this is just the prototype, but the one that 
I'm currently looking at. It's not the best, but it does get the job done. And kind of the last thing on the overall design that I think could be improved in the future, and this is a feature that the normal Carvera had, is that these openings are fully open. The normal Carvera has like a little rubber lining that this thing can move through. That means that all of the dust and the shavings from the things that you're working on can easily fall through here. And there's gaskets on all these rods, so it's not gonna get into the internal gears, but just in terms of cleanup, you're gonna have to get down there and get all that out. And the bottom is not fully enclosed. So you can see right here, as I've pulled this up, um, all the internals are exposed. So especially when I was doing metal chips, I found myself having to move the machine over and like vacuum underneath it versus if this had a seal, that would have been a little bit easier. But let's actually talk about the performance of the machine. And I want to kind of come at it three different angles because you might be coming to a machine like this from a different standpoint. So first we're going to talk about the CNC side of things. So maybe you currently own a CNC or you've got experience with a CNC. How does this stack up? Next, I'm going to talk about the laser feature. And yes, there is a laser attachment that drops in right there, which is pretty cool. And last we'll talk about if you're coming from a more 3D printer workflow like this P1S that I have behind me. So on the CNC side of things, especially if you're coming from those bigger machines, you probably will like the fact that this is pretty compact, especially if whatever you're working on can fit within the work area. And if you're cutting through material, uh, I like that they give you a couple of these like MDF boards, which will just sit right on top of the work bed. Um, these are great if you're cutting through material, you don't actually cut into the work bed itself. And they lock down once you drop in some of these brackets. So I've got a corner bracket in there right now, as well as a few clamps that's holding everything down. But if I took that off, you could replace that MDF board or you could just work with the workbed directly itself. Now with CNCs, there's usually like two big things that you have to do nearly every time. And they're also like really annoying. And one is going to be changing your bit. Normally with machines, you'll have to do this with a couple wrenches. We have to loosen up a nut and then drop it out. Um, the bigger Make Era machine that's more expensive actually has a automatic tool changer. So it'll just drop down, pick up the tool it needs. This does not have that but the process is actually pretty easy. There is a lever right here. We'll see if I do it without looking at it. You just pull that down and you can slide out your bit really easy. Uh, and that is one of the easiest ways if you do have to change a bit that I've ever seen. So I love being able to do that real quick. Um, then if you put something else in, and this is a probe, and we're gonna talk about this here in a second, all you have to do is just pull it down again, you slide this up, and it's easier for actually looking at it, and then you're good to go. Now, the second thing that's annoying, the probe actually helps with a good bit. So the probe has a few functions that are really handy. And one has to do with a laser that is built into the probe itself. Uh, they call this scan uh, margin. And you can see the red laser beam right there. And what it's gonna do, just like with a laser engraver or laser cutter, is it's going to outline the path that the CNC is going to do. With other machines, I've simulated that by like cutting in the air to get an idea of what you're going to do. That's really handy with these to make sure not only are you cutting in the spot that you want, but you're also not gonna hit your clamps. Now, the next feature I really like having a probe for is you can auto level your material. Now, this is just a sheet of aluminum, so it's already level, but it's gonna touch off in several different points. Uh, to get an idea of where the zero point is on the material itself. You can see every time it goes down and touches, there is a little flash on the side of the probe itself. And then once it has that, it can use that data to be able to go in and do whatever you're going to cut out on your material. Now it also has a more traditional uh, zero finder where not only can you find the zero point for the Z height, but you can also do it in the X and Y by using one of these interior corners. So that's nice as well. And then once everything is probed, Oh, if I can reach over here, let's pull that down, pop it out, and then drop in your bit. Everything is locked in and you're good to get. Now, one thing you normally never see with the CNC, for the most part, until you get to the higher end machines, is a rotary, which allows you to do four axis milling. But the Megara Air comes with that. You plug this into a port on the work bed itself. And I love that this has several screw down locations. Specifically, these two on the ends are just for pins that correspond to some pin locations on the work bed itself. So this has to sit in a set location that's indexed by those pins. Then you screw everything down. So whenever you create all of your tool paths, you know you have a rock solid location, especially if you're going to have to do multiple passes, which normally you do. Now, speaking of those tool paths, uh, that process can be 
pretty complicated. But one big thing that Megera has done with both of their machines is they give you example projects, including material that you can run from the jump. So once I got this machine set up, which was literally just me putting this on the desk and plugging it in, not much to it. I could go directly into preloaded tool pass and run it. And in their instructions, they have a good walkthrough on what that is. Now the four axis one I started and then I saw how long it was going to take, like multiple hours. I decided to quit it, but it's nice that you'll be able to see how the rotary works with both a roughing and a finishing tool path. Now one project I did complete is this LED light of R2D2, which they had preloaded, uh, which is nice because I have my big one right back there. Now there's actually four different materials that I used to create this. Um, first was the acrylic. So you'd get that engraved on the inside and then you cut out the acrylic from there. Easy enough for the CNC. And then you had this black ABS that you also cut out from a block. You can see this is a lot thicker than what we were using before. Still worked great. And then finally, I've already got it screwed in, uh, but this is a PCB, which was created from the stock material. So not only did I cut out the PCB from the material, but they also gave you the mask that then you went back and carved off to give you all the points that you would need to solder things down from. I have not made anything like this before, um, but it was really easy. And they walked you step by step through the full process. And then they give you like all the LEDs and the electronics to solder in, create your own. Um, but they also give you a demo one as well, which is the one that I wound up using. And then finally, here on the edge, the circuit is touch capacitive. They have an aluminum button that glues in here as well um, that you obviously cut out from aluminum stock. And with all of those things put together, you wound up with a lamp. And I found going through that full process, you really got to see the range of materials as well as some of the abilities of this machine. And because you're going through a bunch of tool changes, a bunch of work holding options, you really got an idea of how this machine worked. So I love the fact that they included that from the jump. On the CNC side of things, the ease of use definitely stands out. The tool changing, super easy. Being able to trace around whatever your work area is going to be to make sure you're not going to like collide into anything is great. And I was able to push it at some pretty good depths of cuts as well as speeds to be able to get through that material. Now I wasn't pushing it to the extreme, but it definitely was in the right chip load range for the specific bit that I was using. I didn't see any deflection with the bit. The whole structure was rock solid. So that's if you're coming at this from a CNC mill angle. But let's talk about if you have a laser and how this stacks up on the laser side of things. So probably the coolest feature on the laser front is the fact that this is not special in terms of how to attach this to the machine itself. All you have to do is use that same tool changing process and you can drop this in. And this plugs directly into the spindle housing itself and you're good to go. Another cool feature is you can still use the probe in the process of using the laser. So if you have material that isn't super flat, the probe works really great. And it's also going to use that tool setter in the back to be able to find the focus distance for the laser itself. Now this is a pretty low power laser. I'm going to put the power here on the screen. You're definitely not going to be doing any type of cutting with this laser. And the big reason for that is the fact that you'll have air assist with this system. So there's no compressed stream of air going through, helping put out flames and keeping your cuts really clean. You're just going to use that laser for engraving. And that engraving isn't going to be the fastest uh, because you are limited by the speed of these motors. Then those motors and system are set up to be pushed pushing a mill through metal or wood. So there's a lot of torque, but there's not a lot of overall speed. So on the laser side, I would definitely approach this as an add-on so where you might engrave something to start and then cut it out with an actual bit using the CNC mill function of this. And then one thing on the safety side, so this does have a cover that we've talked about, but unlike the other covers on a desktop laser, um, this is not tinted. So this is not going to help block out the diode light that is coming from this laser itself. You're going to need to wear the glasses that come with it to protect your eyes. And you'll have to be really conscious of running this around anybody that doesn't have eye protection on. So if you're in a school or a maker space, you'll have to be really careful using this versus one of those fully enclosed tinted machines like the X-Tool S1 or the Raleigh Lasermatic or all those other ones that I've talked about in the past. Now, last but not least, what if you're coming to this machine from a 3D printer? Right off the bat, this 
isn't a 3D printer. So unlike the Snapmaker, which is a three-in-one CNC laser and 3D printer, this is just a CNC primarily and then a laser. But what if you already own a 3D printer? Features like the probing will be really familiar to you to where the beds on pretty much all 3D printers you're gonna have to level out. And a lot of them will use a auto leveling process that uses a probe to where it's touching off in a bunch of different points. But in general, the process is going to be a lot different for a CNC or even a laser versus a 3D printer because you are removing material, especially with the mill side, but I guess you're kind of removing material with the laser too. So you're not gonna have to worry about filament and heating it up and adhering it to a work bed. Instead, you're gonna have to worry about how you hold your material, the type of bits that you're gonna be using, the speeds and the feeds, and just a different workflow if you're coming from a 3D printing side. And you're really not gonna be able to do true 3D objects. You can definitely do like two and a half D designs. So things that you can cut out that don't have undercuts. So maybe like a terrain for a mountain or like a 3D relief that you might find on a sign. I mean, I guess you technically can do 3D, but you have to use the fourth axis on the mill. And that's a completely other process than what you're going to find on the 3D side. And then honestly, probably one of the biggest differences um, has to do with one of the questions I see the most when anyone is talking about 3D printing. And usually they're asking like, hey, how loud is that machine? Because a lot of 3D printers people will have in their office with them and they might have it running in the background because they take hours and hours a lot of times to be able to create something and they'll be doing work alongside of it and you don't want it being super loud. This is much, much louder. Not just this machine. I mean, the motors themselves are louder than what you find in a 3D printer, but anytime you connect a bit with material, um, it's going to be loud, whether it is wood and then especially if it's metal. This is not gonna be the type of machine that you are running and then you are taking phone calls or you're doing work directly beside and you need it to be quiet. Plus, a lot of times you'll have this hooked up to a vacuum as well. So you're gonna have a vacuum running plus the CNC running plus the mill making lots of noise running through the material. So this is a good bit louder. And more than likely, because those chips and stuff can fall through the machine itself, you'll probably have this in like a garage or just a setting that's a lot easier to clean versus being completely indoors inside of a room itself. Okay, so that's if you're coming from a laser or a 3D printer. We've talked about the CNC milling functions, but how does this stack up against the other CNC mills that are out there, specifically the ones that are this form factor. So they're like a desktop with an enclosure. First, let's talk about its bigger and older brother, just the normal Carvera. That guy is over $5,500. Again, at the time of this recording, the Kickstarter is still running. So you can pick this up for around $1,400. I'm gonna guess once the Kickstarter is over, the retail price is gonna be a little bit over 2,000. So still less than half of the price. And with the bigger Carvera machine, you're gonna have a little bit bigger work area. Uh, probably the biggest difference is going to be the fact that you have that um, automatic tool changer on the side and the motors are going to be servo motors, which are closed loop, meaning they're going to be more precise and the machine kind of always knows where it is relative to space versus this guy, which is running more standard stepper motors. It's going to have some other cool bells and whistles like a wireless probe. So right now this one you have to plug directly in and then it also has an integrated dust slash chip collection system, kind of versus this one, which is a good bit cheaper. And the cover is a lot more solid. Uh, it has gas struts and it just feels a little bit more robust in the build. But in terms of the actual cutting performance, it's still gonna be pretty similar. Uh, you definitely can push stuff a little bit harder with the bigger machine, but it may not be worth twice the amount to you. All right, next up is going to be the Shapeoko Nomad. Shapeoko makes those bigger woodworking CNC style machines, but specifically this is their desktop mill version. Um, it is going to be smaller, so it's eight by eight by three inches versus this guy again, which is like 12 by eight by five. The spindle on that is going to be uh, less at 130 watts versus this guy's 200 watts. Now I don't have a hands-on experience with that machine, um, but the best that I can tell um, overall, this is a better machine for a cheaper amount. So I would definitely go this direction if you were comparing between the two. Now, another company that you could potentially look at that's kind of in this same market is Bantam Tools. Um, this was actually started by the same guy who started MakerBot, uh, like the original 3D printer company way back in the day. And they are definitely a good bit more expensive. Specifically, their like main Bantam machine is nearly $7,000. 
dollars. And the finish of that machine looks very, very nice. They have their own custom software. The spindle itself is 250 watts versus 200 watts. You can definitely tell it is more thought out in general, but I don't know if it's like $5,000 nicer than this machine. In fact, they do have the Bantam Explorer, which is more of their like education focused machine, but still that guy is four grand with specs that match up pretty close to this guy, if not a little bit less. Uh, so if I was comparing the two, I still would lean this direction, but I do know that Bantam's approach is pretty nice on the software side of things. So they do a really good job there as well. Now I'll say probably the most interesting comparison is when you go on the lower end of this machine. And those are gonna be like machines from Sane Smart or Jinmitsu that are these like budget mills that you can get. Normally none of them are gonna have an enclosure. Um, they are just the mill themselves. And a lot of times those are going to be under a thousand dollars. And I will say in general, Carvera has basically taken that design, beefed it up and given you a lot of ease of use features. So so those are more of a stripped down machine that's not gonna have the performance of this right here. But depending on your budget, one of those machines might work for you. I actually hope to review some more of those smaller machines in the future because those price points I know get a lot closer to what some people may be looking at. Now software is one thing you'll definitely wanna think through as you're working with these machines. It comes with the Carvera controller, which just controls the machine. You're gonna to have to have your tool pass already generated and then you upload it to the controller and then and send it to the machine. If you want to generate those tool paths, that's where it gets a little bit more tricky. They have their own CAM software, which lets you generate designs and then tool paths from it. Um, it is just on a PC. I think they're gonna have a beta version for the Mac here pretty soon, but I haven't been able to check that out. Normally you can use something like Fusion 360, especially if you're doing like more metal stuff that are actual parts. You could use VCarve, although that is PC only as well. And actually I find if I'm just doing wood stuff, I wind up using Venable's easel software super easy to generate designs, export the G code, and I was able to import those directly in there as well. I do hope to do an update once I have access to their CAM software, because being able to have a fully integrated system um, will make this a little bit easier to get into. But know that you're not locked into their specific software. You can pretty much use this with anything. That also makes it a little bit more difficult to kind of get stuff into it. All right, so my recommendation for this machine this really sits in a pretty interesting sweet spot where it is like more expensive than a budget beginner machine, way more expensive than what you might find. But, and it's a lot less expensive than what you would typically find with like a four axis CNC mill. It's like right in between. But I would say right off the bat, the biggest limiting thing is if you have material that is bigger than the workbed itself, um, don't go this direction because this isn't gonna work for you. But if you definitely value the ease of use, um, just the overall robustness in terms of the build and you're okay with diving into software and generating your own tool paths, this could be a really good option. And especially if you are learning CNC, this could be a cool option because there's a lot of stuff that goes into it in terms of generating your designs, the tool paths, the bits, the feeds and the speeds, the work holding. This introduces you to all of that while still being a very capable machine to be able to give you a finished part at the end of the day. I would love to know what you guys think of this machine. Drop a comment down below. We're gonna jump it to a much, much cheaper desktop CNC mill review right now. Until next time, go make or break something in your shop. See you guys.